Yeah, that's totally true. So I want to, uh, we'll, we'll get to uh, Starmer and Bi- Biden in a few minutes, but I mean, uh, Ross Dothot has a column in the New York Times today. Uh, and, you know, it's very disturbing because in the sense that this is a, you know, he's obviously he's a smart guy, but he's a very, not only is he a right wing guy, I mean, he is, his whole, his base of politics is culturalist politics. In his case, I would say reactionary culturalist politics. But his read on the moment, you know, he's extremely perceptive about where things could quite easily go um, with the uprisings that we have in the United States right now. And he, you know, to his credit, I mean, he soft pedals it, but he says, look, I understand that there are some people involved, and I would, I would say most people, uh, involved in, in, in Black Lives Matter uprisings have a, a connection uh, between uh, these issues of police violence and racism uh, to uh, income distribution, to capital accumulation, to uh, the redistributive policies that need to go along with uh, the defunding and uprooting policies. Um, and he says, you know, that's there, but what I see as a more likely outcome uh, is basically that the, you know, and this is the, what Adolf Reed outlines, that this is sort of like there will be greater representation in elite ranks, of course, relative to not representation. Greater representation is better than not representation, but it is not at all an uprooting of the fundamentals of power and distribution and class dynamics in a society. It's not going to have any agenda for the masses of people who of course still overwhelmingly mostly are, are people of color, but also people of every single background who are seriously suffering in this economy. And they'll only suffer more as the kind of fundamental trends not lock in. And he said, you know, there will be a sort of changeover in discursive strategies in elite institutions that will affect kind of like woke sort of frameworks. There will be, uh, you know, more kind of HR politics. And, and you know, this can also breed into the, the various kind of like moral panics and, to, and toxicities and, you know, complete antithetical to solidarity that we see in social media. Um, and, you know, it's disturbing to me because here's a guy that does not have our politics at all, one way or another, I think much more accurately discerning the dangers of where we're at um, than a fair amount of people, um, you know, and some parts of the left. So, and then on the other extreme, I just want to say, I mean, we just had a conversation before with William Shockey last weekend, we talked with Sean Jacobs for the Jacobin and there is absolutely this other parallel, uh, in terms of the enormous potential of these uprisings. However, if they go the direction that Delta has outlined, then we have like a kind of another, um, you know, maneuver away from structural politics. And, you know, that's, um, and he framed it as, you know, Bernie's second defeat, basically, that this is like the next bottle up of any kind of sort of mass-based solidarity. Yeah, I saw the piece. Um, It was interesting. I mean, on the one hand, on the right, produces pieces like that, you've always got to ask what kind of fissures within the left are they pressing on? Right. But a lot of what he says, uh, as, as you point out, is a, is a one potential future here. It's one potential road that these protests could go down. That the defeat of Bernie Sanders, or say in Britain, the defeat of Corbyn, means that the kind of social democratic politics, the economic politics, and the structure of politics moves off the pitch. And what you get instead is a kind of return to some of the NGOism, return to some of the representational politics and things which are much more trapped within the safer um, sphere of, of liberalism. That's, that's one potential, which is why, in my view, one of the lessons we have to learn from, from Bernie and from Corbyn is about how we're building coalitions. On what basis are we building these coalitions? Um, and, you know, in, in what sense do we imagine them? The, both Bernie and Corbyn represented a vision of a majoritarian politics. This idea, which, which is actually fundamentally the most important question of socialism, is the idea that 
our politics is about representing the majority of people who work for a living, who rely on their wages to live, uh, against the minority of people who own the economy and use that, therefore, to ruin society and their interests. That is the only real power that, that we have, but it is a real power, that we represent this, this working uh, majority. And that question has to be at the forefront of how we build uh, coalitions, whereas some of the, the kind of ideas that had come out of the left, particularly in the periods of defeat that became really dominant in the 90s and 2000s, were this idea that instead of um, focusing on what our power is, our ability to put together a majority of people and to build solidarity within that majority, that what we will do instead is simply uh, pick a whole series of categories of minority and try to, stri to stitch those together and focus on actually the, the powerlessness, focus on the oppression. And it's almost a patrician attitude from above for a kind of middle class left um, that will look down and say, well, you know, who's put upon and okay, we'll support this group or we'll support that group. Instead of the uh, work class or the proletarian kind of idea of what the left is about, which says, no, we will deal with questions of anti-racism within a class and socialist movement by saying, you know, if you are happy to to allow, you know, black workers to be treated in this way by, by the cops, well, then it'll be them uh, today, but it'll be you tomorrow. And in Britain, we have a very, very clear uh, example of this, where we can we can point to the Orgreave um, uh, disaster, the Orgreave uh, uh, tragedy um, where the uh, the miners were beaten the hell out of um, uh, during the miners' strike by an organised and paramilitarised police action in Britain. Um, as an example of, you know, this is what happens when the police get out of control and when they believe that they're entitled to do what they want above and beyond um, uh, what what should be within their powers to do when you when you have systemic police violence this is this is what it produces uh, and when you have a kind of a system where racism is so uh, thoroughly built into it well then what you know might today um, be uh, racism against one group will be racism against another tomorrow and so you know for Irish people now the very same headlines that we see at, uh, in the press about migrants asylum seekers particularly Muslims in Britain today well they were the headlines written about us in the 80s and in the 70s and right. and this is this is our, our, the way in which we have to build solidarity we have to build an understanding of a collective struggle rather than a struggle that can be siloed into all of various different groups and managed, to be frank, much like the, the kind of the, the Irish in Britain tried to manage our struggle in the, in the 70s and 80s, where you had, you know, if you wanted to deal with the Irish, you'd go to the priest and the priest would tell you what was basically acceptable or not. Or you'd go to the, the building magnate and the building magnate would tell you what was acceptable. Whereas the Irish lads working on the, um, on the building site or the, the Irish people who were, you know, being abused by the church, were having their voices completely written out instead right. of a situation like that where you have all these little community groups that are all in their own silos and creating spaces for you know career progression for very small numbers of people we need to have a struggle that unites um, people who are fighting for a different kind of society that can put together a social majority in the interests of real change, obviously, in my view, in the interests of socialist politics, but at the very least, a common program that, that talks about structural economic change, that talks about the deep injustices in our society and how we're going to tackle them, um, and that does it not by um, you know focusing on the, the points at which people are powerless but focusing on the, the thing that gives us power in society which is the fact that we are the majority of people which is the fact that we are representing a hated a despised we're up against the hated and despised ruling class um who own um the the economy and ever greater amounts so smaller and smaller proportions of people you know five percent 3%, 1%, 0.1% owning huge proportions of our uh, economy uh, without any legitimacy in terms of the narratives they're even trying to put forward now on how they're entitled to it and why they should own it. And the vast majority of people know this. And so we can put together those kind of coalitions. Um, and the last few years have shown us, you know, the, the, the potential, just the potential, just the beginning of what it might look like if people turned around and accepted that the way to resolve the frustrations in their lives was to direct the anger upwards instead of 
down instead of towards people on welfare or people who are from a different racial group or people who uh, are transgender or whatever else. If we can unite people and direct the anger upwards, well, then we have a chance of changing things. If we don't and we allow the kind of fragmentation and disintegration of, of, of the left in the coming years uh, into all of its various uh, groupings, well, then I think all of our struggles will be weaker. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks, everybody.